When do you start a new line of action? Why do you start a new line of action? And what do you capitalize? We're going to be taking a look at the Avengers script, the screenplay for Up, and my own screenplay. And I'll explain why you would format your action and your description in the ways you see in popular scripts. Let's dig deeper into screenplay formatting. What's up, storytellers? I'm Jay Shear, author of the time travel novel Time Slingers and the upcoming novel and full cast audiobook, Death of a Bounty Hunter. But today we're focused on scripts and screenplay formatting. Specifically, how do you format your action and your description? We'll dig deeper into that. But in the meantime, check out thestorygeeks.com for all the resources you need, especially if you want to produce your own science fiction, fantasy, and comic book stories. And we're going to look at action and description, more specifically action in this particular scene. One of the most classic scenes, probably what will go down at least in recent history, and that is the scene that is basically referred to as the portal scene. But I wanted to pick this one because this is like the most action you can possibly have in a scene. The entire scene is a battle scene, and we're going to go through it piece by piece and just pick up on some of the things that the screenwriters are doing here. So first off, it's going to give us the scene heading, which we talked about in previous videos, and that is that we are um, outside the Avengers compound. We're in a crater or in the crater in this crater area, and it is um, daytime. And of course, daytime in this context, the production design here is like, <laughs> it doesn't seem like daytime because there's a lot of apocalyptic things happening. But let's go look at the action. Now, one of the things I want to point out before we start reading it is that in a lot of this action, you're going to see what we would call like beats and or the focus of the camera in the action is what separates one line from another. So I'll, I'll show you. Steve, this is Steve Rogers, Captain America, slashes at Thanos. Thanos is the giant villain. The Titan brutally bats him aside. Okay, so that is a one unit of action. That is a shot of Steve Rogers slashing at Thanos and then T Thanos tossing him aside. Now you'll note that we break that paragraph for another line. And the, the next line is Thor attacks, but Thanos drives him through walls of debris. Thanos smashes his fist into Thor's face over and over. Now, a couple questions that I would ask and a couple questions that you might ask. First of all, um, we understand now why we made a new paragraph because uh, we're not paying attention to Steve anymore. Now we're paying attention to Thor. And we want to see Thor and Thanos' interaction with one another. There's a lot of movement in this scene because Thanos is driving him through walls of debris. So that makes sense that why we would start a new paragraph. What then doesn't make as much sense is why would you make that entire second sentence capital? And I, I honestly probably would not make it capital. I probably would have not capitalized um, that particular sentence. Capitalization when in action um, is going to try to draw out either things that are important to the production design. Let's, let's say that there's an item or even if you have an action that you really want to emphasize, you would do that with all caps, which is what they're doing. Thanos smashes his fist into Thor's face over and over. I don't know that that needed capitalization in my opinion, but that's what they're using capitalization for. The next thing that's a, that's a little bit probably odd is that we're going to break this so there's, they're saying, I think they're probably trying to indicate that there's a beat or that there's a camera change. This could all be done with one shot. There's one shot where Thanos drives him through walls of debris and then starts smashing his face. That could all be one shot. Um, but then we're going to have Thor calls for Stormbreaker, but Thanos intercepts it. He presses the blade into Thor's chest, trying to drive it home. Now, theoretically speaking, you could have made these two paragraphs the same you didn't need to, you didn't need to separate this generally speaking what you would try to do with action from a screenplay writing standpoint is separate um again like i said shots or beats of action where you're like okay well technically this is a se separate beat of action you're going to notice in this avengers script because there's so much action they're constantly breaking into new lines and this is an area where i'm not sure that they needed to do that but you'll see why they would need to do the next break which is then across the field millionaire millionaire <laughs> milliner millionaire however you want to say that i think it's million millionaire rises into the air now 
there's emphasis there because from a production design standpoint, it's going to have to be like a special effect probably there. So it makes sense to capitalize that. I can see why they would do that. I still may not have capitalized that, but I can see why they would in this case. And we know that we're not looking at Thor and um, Thanos anymore. We're looking at Millionaire. So that's why there's a second break there. And that makes sense. Then we're going to break again and go to Thanos grins about to finish Thor off when Millionaire flies in, knocking the axe out of his hand. Um, so that also makes sense as another break because now we're back to looking at Thanos. What doesn't make as much sense to me is why all of this is capitalized. Um, then it's going to say that we follow the hammer as it flies back to the only other man worthy to wield it, Steve Rogers. Now, this is interesting to me because they made this all caps and then they did not make this all caps. And this is like one of the biggest moments in the film itself. When we follow the hammer back and it goes to Steve Rogers, that was like a moment where like all the audience got chills in that moment when it goes to Steve. Why? Because he's the only other person that is worthy enough to wield it. And that to me would have been of all the things that they've capitalized thus far. And this is probably what I would have capitalized. Um, also, I've already read a lot of this script and you'll notice that whenever it refers to a character's full name, they will always, almost always cap it. Um, in fact, I don't know if I've found an area where they haven't capped it yet. You'll notice that when they mentioned Steve back here or Thor here or Thanos here, even Thanos here, um, they did not cap it, but most of the time they're capitalizing the full names. So then we go from this iconic moment in film history where Steve Rogers is wielding Millionaire and we move to half-conscious Thor sees Steve holding Millionaire. And he goes, I knew it. He says, I knew it. Um, now, half-conscious Thor sees Steve holding. Now, this is a pretty big moment as well, but still not as big as this moment. You might have said, like, the fall of the hammer as it flies back to the only other man worthy to wield it. Steve Rogers, millionaire in hand. I would, then I could have capitalized all that, right? That's like a huge emphasis. So some of this is going to be stylistic to you personally, what you're trying to communicate, what you're trying to emphasize. Um, they have a lot of this stuff capped. I would not have done that, but it's the style that they're using. And these are obviously amazing filmmakers. So you, you can't go wrong copying amazing people. Um, so I'm going to skip down a little bit because we're going to keep seeing some of the same stuff, um, start to happen. Um, and I want to get down to this next scene. So this is a cool scene too. So Thanos is starting to win in this case, right? And Steve stares at Thanos and his army, even in the face of such overwhelming odds, he gets to his feet. And again, another really classic moment and it's not capitalized. Um, Thanos stares almost sad. I don't know why they capitalized Thanos in this case as Steve tightens the broken shield on his arm and starts walking toward him. Now, one of the things I will say when I keep questioning why they're capitalizing these things, they could be thinking that movement needs to be capitalized. They could be thinking that this is a specific, there's a specific style where they've let the production designers know or let the directors know. Maybe the directors have been working so the Russo brothers in this case have been working with Marcus and McFeely and they're talking about the fact that they want these kinds of things emphasized in their scripts. So it could be a non-standard thing, but it could be a standard thing that this crew does together when they work on scripts. Just FYI. So one man against thousands all alone. But then Steve's calm crackles. He strains to hear the calm crackles again. We can make out a muffled voice. And then you hear it, it's kind of like breaking up. Steve shakes his head, trying to clear it. Slowly sound returns and the words ring clear cap on your left. And this opens up into, again, like I said, one of the most classic scenes in recent movie cinema history. Maybe Martin Scorsese wouldn't call it cinema, but we definitely would. We pull back to see a portal opening in the distance. Out of it flies Sam Wilson. Now, I can see a lot of this being capitalized. You notice that it's, they're recommending that the camera pull back. Um, it's There's a lot of debate in writing circles about how much camera direction writers should do. There's a lot of different opinions on the subject. My personal opinion is that if you can do if you can write the scene and not do a camera um description the can't what telling the camera what to do 
um, then I would write the scene without it. But there are, there are a lot of cases where there's no other way to communicate what you're trying to communicate except to put in um, a camera direction. So, I mean, do what you gotta do, right? So the portal scene is a big scene. We're gonna transition into this. Steve watches Sam soar over the field and then turns as even more portals open from one Doctor Strange, Peter Quill, Drax, Mantis, Peter Parker, and Kraglin and the, Reven the Ravagers. Um, from another T'Challa, Okoye, Shuri, M'Baku, Wanda, Bucky, Groot, and the Wakandan army. Obviously you can read all of this. I won't read them all. Notice that they are bolding the names. I think that they're bolding the names for a very specific reason. In this film, I think that what they're probably trying to do when the directors are skimming through the script and they want to know, you got you to gotta imagine like as a screenwriter, think of how many moving parts the Russo brothers and Marcus and McFeely are dealing with. They got to know where every single character is blocking these scenes uh, from the director, meaning setting up the scene about where they're going to film, which sort of action and who's going to be in it where is a big deal. There's a lot going on. There's, there's more going on in this film than in 99% of the films ever made in the history of <laughs> mankind. It's so complex. So I have an assumption that, that probably what they're trying to do by bolding the names is just making sure that they know where all of these people are and what all of these people are doing and who's next to whom. So that's the Avengers. That's a really classic scene. You can see a couple things from these. You can make sure that you're emphasizing where the characters are, what the characters are doing, and that the most important action is included. You'll know that there's not like a ton of description per every single possible action. Prose, in prose, in writing prose, if you're writing a novel, let's say, you would include a lot of more details in this. But it, as a screenwriter, you know that multiple people are going to work on this and add their own flavor to it and add things to it that is that are going to make it um, improve. They're going to improve it in some way, shape, or form. And your script does not need to dictate how they do that. Of course, in prose, you're the only person writing it, so if, and you're the only person working on it, so of course you need to describe it in a lot of detail. But you don't need to do that as much in the screenplay, so you can see it's all beat by beat. Here's the action, here's the action, here's the action, moving forward, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'm gonna jump into another script before I get into one of mine and we'll take a look at how they're doing action in the next script. So here is the script for Up. You're gonna notice that this has obviously been scanned in by somebody. Um, I just got a PDF of it online. Most scripts, if you search for them, you can find an example script. I will say you do need to be careful because some scripts have actually been, um, first of all, there are multiple types of scripts that you can find online. Some are shooting scripts, which means it's a more finalized script, the script the director is using. And it may not be the original script that the writers wrote. It's been through multiple iterations. So just know that you can find different kinds of scripts depending on what you find online. Um, the other thing you can find is you can find transcribed scripts. So someone's actually just watching the movie and then making a script out of the movie. But it's not technically what the writers originally wrote. It's some other person online just doing it. So whenever you see me going over a script, usually I'm trying to find the ones that um, – showcase that it was the writing script or the shooting script but that's not always something we can find so anyways just want to let you know that up front and let's take a look at like this is the way that up the pixar film up begins a 1930s newsreel so it's giving us an idea of what this is going to look like from a visual um, component and we're going to focus again on the action and description here which is really important I uh, will do a uh, I'll do a separate video on dialogue. If you're wondering like why why aren't you talking about dialogue? Well, I'll get to dialogue later. You're gonna notice the first thing I want you guys to notice is that like the scene heading there is no scene heading here. There's not, nothing came before this. This is page one, right? This is this is the cover page right here, and then I'm gonna scroll down and this is page one. So they didn't even do a screen heading, and this is uh, interesting because this is sort of like almost as if we're saying there's a clip before we even get into the script, and this is sort of a different thing this is a different kind of clip before we get into the rest of the script so we're looking at a 1930s newsreel the mysterious south american jungle a massive waterfall cascades down a gigantic flat topped mountain and you'll notice that they um 
capitalized newsreel. They're trying to draw attention to that. They're trying to draw attention to South American jungle so that when the animators, so this, in this case, the director is going to be somebody who's directing animators, not directing a production crew. But when they, when they want to try to direct the, this whole scene, they're trying to send to the animation team, well, we want this to look like a South American jungle. So what is, what's the animation team going to do? They're going to go try and find pictures of what the South American jungle would look like and then replicate that in animation. Um, if this were a non, if this was live action instead of animation, then what we would probably see is that we would see uh, the mysterious South American jungle. And then of course the location scouts would have to go find somewhere in the South American jungle. And then this would be described a massive waterfall cascades down a gigantic flat topped mountain they would have to find something that looked like that and this is where a shooting script can differ from a writing script because a writer might have a location in mind but let's say that the location count scouts can't find that exact location well then they might not get a massive waterfall cascading down a gigantic flat topped mountain maybe it's a different kind of mountain right um a painted portrait of a dashing young adventurer a massive dirigible uh descends on an airfield all of these things that have happened now are like things that are going to appear on the screen. And so you can see why these descriptors would be included. You can also tell that they're not spending a lot of time on the description of the things. So we've been talking a lot about action because we were looking at the Avengers script. This is a little bit more about description. Like, what does this look like? And in this case, they're not giving us a lot of what it looks like. They're expecting the, in this case, the animators and the director to go put all of this together, but they're not needing to describe all of the uh, details relative to what it looks like. If you were writing this as a novel, you would have to describe what a dashing young adventurer actually looked like, or you'd have to describe what a dirigible actually looked like. Um, now, one note of context I want to make here too. If there were things about these descriptions that were really important, like for example, if this was the Rocketeer, there is a dirigible in the Rocketeer. It's important that we know in the Rocketeer that it is a Nazi dirigible and that it has a giant swastika on the back of it. Why is it important that we know that? Because that is critical to the story of the Rocketeer. If you've seen the Rocketeer, you would know what I'm talking about. So in this story, we it just has to be your everyday standard dirigible. But in the Rocketeer, we might have to, we might have to as screenwriters add additional detail to make sure that we capitalize on that particular piece of things. Now we're going to get into more. We have a scene heading. So now we're going to get into more of what we would consider the, the, the general movie and we're inside a movie theater and this is continuous based on it. Like for example, what they could be suggesting with this screen heading, and we've talked about screen headings before, but just to get an idea for what's happening in the action, you could interpret this if you were a director as, okay, well, I want to focus on the screen in the theater and then i'm going to pull back and as i pull back we're going to it's going to reveal that we're in a movie theater and this is all continuous that's different than cutting and then showing the movie theater right it's a different kind of style so I just want to throw that out there of everyone watching in the modest small town theater no one is more enthralled than eight-year-old carl Fredrickson. now let's take a look at this line specifically so it wants us to know that we're in a movie theater and it wants us to then focus in on Carl Fredrickson. And we know that we're in a modest small town theater, but unlike the South American jungle, this was not all capped, right? The modest small town theater was not all capped. So just wanted you guys to know that there's like these little things that happen in screenplays where you're, we're, we're just, where the emphasis is more so on Carl Fredrickson than it is on the small town theater. And so the, the writer is sort of saying that now, now you'd almost always cap all cap the first time a character appears in your film, you would almost always uh, cap that. So that's pretty normal standard action and description there. Young Carl stares mouth agape wearing leather flight helmet and goggles just like his idol on the silver screen. So of course the designers would have had to read this first page in its entirety to know that the character that we saw earlier on screen was also wearing a flight helmet and goggles. 
I will tell you that as a writer, I might have emphasized that by including it back up here. So if we go back to this, a painted portrait of a dashing young adventurer, I probably would have said wearing a leather flight helmet and goggles. So that when I got down to this line, young Carl stares, mouth agape, wearing a leather flight helmet and goggles, just like his idol up on the silver screen, both parties knew that that was supposed to happen. There, are, It could happen, it's unlikely, but it could happen where the production designers uh, you know, didn't read both those lines in context and they did not give the the person up here, the, the um, dashing young adventurer, they did not give him or her a leather flight helmet and goggles. And then also we see Carl with them and he doesn't look just like his idol on the silver screen. Again, it's very unlikely, but it could happen. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, we're going to go back to the newsreel footage. Now, this gives the director and the animators some uh, a, the ability to do something different, right? So what they could do is I think it's suggesting that they actually flash into a full screen of newsreel footage. And I think that they're going to do that because we see um, this line of dialogue happen. And then we see also an opulent dining room. However, it's giving them the flexibility to say, let's just picture young Carl in the theater and now the camera's looking over his shoulder and we're actually watching on the screen as he watches this newsreel footage happen. So in other words, what I'm saying is the writers aren't being so descriptive that you that it must be one way or the other. It doesn't say like, now zoom into the screen. It just says newsreel footage and then the director and everyone working on this film can kind of do whatever they want to. But you'll also notice that we are getting, again, the beats of things, right? A dashing month uh, descends down the gangplank to the delight of the crowd. His dog trails him. That's a shot. That's a shot that's happening. It's a, a beat of, of screen time. Then we see an opulent dining room. One dog ru runs and suffers through mechanized bath time while a second wears an electrode helmet and runs on a treadmill. So it's showing, now that's two different things, but probably those two things are in the same shot, which is why they're in the same paragraph. Cameras flash as Muntz stands heroic, striking his signature thumbs up stance. So that's very different from this, uh, from the previous description, the previous action. Um, in the theater, young Carl returns the thumbs up. So we probably are looking over Carl's um, shoulder in this case, or we were just flashing back to it. Otherwise, I think you could do a new scene heading and it's like Carl in the theater versus what's on screen. But the screenwriters are being very strategic with what they're showing and or not showing here. Um, so, yeah, that that's gives you another feel for what's going on and another screenwriter's style in addressing this material. All right. Now we're going to get into my script. This this is a short film that we're currently that's currently titled Ravenous. Um, and in my script, I can tell you exactly why I was putting specific things in, um, and, uh, the emphasis that I'm trying to put on them. Um, just, just, uh, as a further note, I, as a writer tend to, I have a prose background. I started in prose. I didn't start in screenwriting. So you're going to see more description than you might normally see in certain scripts. And that's just because it's my background and so that's not necessarily always correct and you should always you know read other people's things so that you kind of know what is the best way of showcasing things but this i can talk about in detail because i know why i did things obviously so we start um exterior desert night again talked about scene headings in a separate um in a separate video so go check that out but then jagged rock formations jut up out of the sand like the gnarled fingers of a buried colossus the rugged terrain awash in soft blue white aurora light looks beautiful but inhospitable so i'm setting the scene um because i, I there's a couple things that need to be in this scene notice that i have not capitalized anything in this scene and I'm not capitalizing any, anything in this scene because as a producer, I am aware that I might not be able to find a location that has jog, jagged rock formations jutting up out of the sand. I might not be able to get this blue, white Aurora light. Uh, that might be too hard to do from a production standpoint. It may require me to pay too much in production costs. And so I don't capitalize those things because they are not essential to making sure that this scene 
is great. I do like the setup so that I can give the director a feel for what I'm looking for as a writer and a producer, but these things can be negotiable. So none of them are capped. Now, in the, now that's one beat. You can also picture that as maybe a shot. We're looking at something that's a wide shot. We see all of these things. A director might choose to shoot that from the ground up, might choose to shoot that from uh, from above, down, looking down. The director has a lot of leeway in how he or she wants to film this scene, but uh, I still want to communicate that this is the area that we're in. Then we jump to the orange glow from a nearby campfire reflects off an open canteen covered in dust. It rests on the ground, dry and empty. Oh, but it's just really quick note. Everything here is in um, present tense, present tense. So third person, present tense. That is generally speaking how screenplays are written in uh, the third person present tense as if kind of as if you're the camera look and what you're looking at to a certain degree. Um, so the orange glow from a nearby campfire reflects off an open canteen covered in dust. It rests on the ground, dry and empty. Now, I've given you the scene setting in the first paragraph. In this second paragraph, I'm suggesting, I'm making, I'm making a suggestion, suggestion here subtly to the director that what we really care about is that there is a campfire and that there is a canteen covered in dust. I care about that canteen so much and I don't want to reveal too much of what else is going on in this scene because I want to build tension through the reveals of specific items over the course of several beats. So I'm not saying here's a big wide shot. We need to see a campfire. We need to see a canteen. We need to see the other things that I'm going to bring up in a minute. No, I'm saying here's the first beat. Here's the second beat. This is almost, I'm almost suggesting that this should be filmed via close up. but you notice I'm not saying close up on a canteen or a campfire. But if I were the director of this, that's exactly what I would do. I would focus in on this canteen and I would know that there was a campfire that, so I needed the audio. I needed to hear the audio of a campfire. I needed to see the orange glow reflecting off the canteen and that the canteen is in the dirt and that it's dry and empty. So I'm emphasizing these things with capital letters and I'm writing it in such a way that you can only see, quote unquote, I'm using quotation marks here on the audio. Um, you can see these things. Behind it, a few feet away, sits a leather satchel. I'm imagining that the way I would film this is that I would have the camera move towards the leather satchel from the canteen. So you go, boom, canteen, there it is, close up, and then we're moving towards the leather satchel. One thing that I would not necessarily recommend doing very often in a script is having this audio suggestion. I say a low rumble begins. That's probably not something you would normally put in a script. Since I'm going to also produce this script, I'm like, yeah, I want there to be a rumble. So I want to remind myself that there's a rumble. The rumble indicates something to me. I can talk about that later in another video. But ordinarily, this is, you would not put this as a screenwriter in your script. Just FYI. A hand snatches the satchel up off the ground. Two hands, both caked with dirt, open it and search frantically inside. It's empty. Now, the reason why I say these things in this order is because I want these shots to be pretty quick. I want these shots to be focused on. I want these different items to be... Now, granted, I'm not saying it's a series of shots, so they're not like quick cuts between one thing and between the next thing. If I had said, here's a series of shots, which I talk about in a video that is for our VIP, the Story Geeks Club members, um, which I would love for you to become a member of that group and you get access to some of this additional content, you can go see that additional content on there. I talk about a series of shots and a series of shots would be like, boom, 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 boom. Here's these different scenes taking place in, it might be in the same location, but it's different time frames. It might be like several different locations, but it's all about the same thing. I'm not doing that here, meaning I'm not doing a series of shots because I think that the ideal way to film this scene, I'm not the director, but I think the, the ideal, ideal way to reveal information to the audience is for the camera to travel along a path that continues to reveal more and more of the scene to us. And so I'm doing that subtly why now let's talk about why i am doing that because i believe it is the most interesting way to build tension in this scene therefore i think the audience is going to respond to this stimulus from a writing and visual perspective in the best way possible and this is the way i'm 
doing that. Now you'll see, um, I'm going to skip down here a little bit because there's a couple more things I want to point out. We see the satchel falls to the ground beside the canteen, useless. Here's El Nino. We actually changing this character to a female, so it's going to be La Nina, and we're going to say her back to us. Now, when you describe action, there are some, there are various thoughts on this. Um, sometimes people will say we see this, we see that. You'll notice I say his back to us. Well, that's kind of a weird thing to put because. As a prose writer, you would never say us, like you would never use that. You would never use the term we, um, you just wouldn't do that. Uh, tends to be used a lot more fre frequently in screenplays. I don't love using it personally because I like the writing to stand for itself and be descriptive enough for itself. But there are times when you have to use it. How else would I be able to describe that you could only see El Nino's back, right? I have to say, we can only see El Nino's back. Why am I saying that? Because we're gonna, move around to finally see him in a different context i'm trying to hide his face if if you were watching the beginning of indiana jones and the raiders of the lost ark we eventually pan up to indiana jones's face but you wouldn't want to do that from from the first moment of the film because that's a cool iconic moment so if, if you want to say like indiana jones is making his way through the forest you want to make sure that we can't see his face and so you might say his back is to us we only see his back. We only see his legs, whatever. Um, but just so you know. Also, you'll notice that I have description. Uh, this is a lot of description for a character in a short film. But I, but again, this is a genre short film. And so I can't just say like El Nino, jeans and t-shirt, right? Like I, that doesn't make sense. Uh, I could say dress contemporarily if this was a story about a kid going on a hike. This is not what the story is about. This This story actually has a it's set in a world of ours that is a steampunk, dark fantasy, Western world. And so I feel the need to give you additional details about what he, which will be a she, um, in the next iteration of this, is actually wearing. By the way, the female character is wearing almost identical clothing as the male character would have worn. So that, that makes it easy to change. But my point being, I'm describing it a little extra because it is a genre film. Now... I don't think you would see that in the Avengers because in the Avengers it'd be like, well, it's Iron Man. Like we, like there's so much documentation of who Iron Man is and what Iron Man wears that you would not need to add additional context in that, in that setting. I have capitalized the name. It will be, like I said, La Nina uh, in the future, but the, the name is capital to draw, draw attention to this is one of our characters. And then it goes on to describe two weapons that um, he, in this case, but again, will be she, uh, has. And that's a blunderbuss. When you'll notice a mosaic of pencil-thin copper pipes winding around its stock. And you'll notice that, there, that um, he has a revolver as well. So why have I described these things? In the future, I will describe a rifle that this character uses. And the rifle has a very steampunk type of a scope to it. It's because that these are items that need to be paid attention to. These are items that will be used by the character, and therefore we draw want to draw attention to those items. And again, think of each beat, think of each part of this screenplay, each line as another thing that the camera is seeing and another beat that you are trying to draw attention to that is separate from the beat before it. If we were writing this in, in prose, a lot of this stuff could be in one paragraph but we can't do one paragraph because we have to think more visually as to what am I seeing now? What am I seeing now? What am I seeing now? And because of that, you're gonna break up your action. You're gonna break up your description a lot more. If you're using more contemporary characters, you won't need this level of description unless there are specific things that are inherent in the character that matter to the visual aspects of them. If you're doing genre, you may need to explain it a little more. And I think that probably covers all of the things that you're going to want to look at in regards to description and or action. But if, again, I'm always wanting to say, if you have questions, feel free and ask them in the comments. I'd be happy to help you out and help you really format your screenplay well. That was um, That's the main goal of what we're doing here in this video, and I appreciate you guys checking it out.
Do you have any questions about what I just talked about? Feel free and ask them in the comments down below. Or maybe you have a suggestion to make, leave those down in the comments below as well. If you wanna write and produce your very own science fiction and fantasy stories, make sure you subscribe to this channel because we're going to help you do that by showcasing how we do it. If you like this video, please bash that like button for me and share this with somebody you know who's working on a script. Don't forget one way to get access to additional content is to join the Story Geeks Club as a VIP member. Check that out at patreon.com slash thestorygeeks. Thanks for watching and I will catch you on the next video.